Welcome back, everybody. It is awkward as hell. Uh, it's the awkward interviews. I have the incredible Samuel Sinyangwe. He is a data analyst and policy advisor and so much more. Um, born to Jewish and Tanz Tanzanian parents, um, he comes from a long line of facing oppression and overcoming it. Um, an alum of Stanford, where he studied the intersections of race, class, economics, and politics. Today, my friend Sam is the go-to expert on killings by police. Um, Sam has discussed uh, being moved to action um, after the 2013 acquittal of Zimmerman after he murdered Trayvon Martin. Um, it's you'll It'll become clear that it started long before then. Um, but I think this was a pretty poignant moment uh, because this where it occurred is exactly where Sam attended soccer practice. Um, he was quoted as saying, I was that kid. I could have been Trayvon. Um, that's why it hit me so personally. And that's why I realized that I needed to be something that took the priority in terms that it needed to be something that took the priority in terms of my focus. And that's what he did. Um, Sam started his career with Policy Link, and then during Ferguson, connected with on the ground activists. Uh, Sam founded, uh, alongside some other um, activists, We the Protesters, an organization aimed at developing a set of digital tools to support Black Lives Matter. Then he created Mapping Police Violence, um, one of the sites that I visit most by far. And to be clear, it is mappingpoliceviolence.us. He created the police scorecard. He also co-founded Campaign Zero, an abolitionist platform we looked at closely while developing the 10 demands. Um, if it wasn't clear already, I'm a big fan of Sam's work and I'm really excited to have him here. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Absolutely, it's good to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So um, I don't even know, you know, you know, I'd like to begin with people understanding the person behind the statistics. Um, you know, it when I share statistics, I consider it a duty as a Jewish ally, because my story is less significant as, as someone who is less directly impacted. Um, People don't envision, and this is racism, just to be clear, people don't envision the Black data scientist, right? Um, what, Sam's, what Sam does is not necessarily uncommon, although it should be a lot more common. He happens to do it incredibly well, and it's also supported by the same fire that drives everything that I do. Um, so take us back, Sam, to the beginning. Um, you know, what initially inspired you and how has that fire just grown over the years? Yeah, so, um, you know, I grew up in Orlando, Florida. Um, and so, so you know, as a, as a Black boy going through, you know, the school system in Orlando, Florida, which, you know, sounds like Disney World and Universal, but outside of that, it is, I mean, it is the South, right? You're going through incredibly segregated system um, that is, you know, a legacy of Jim Crow and before that slavery. Um, and so, you know, going through that that system, it was very clear early on. I mean, I'm talking about maybe age six, seven, eight, um, that something was unfair uh, happening, and that people who looked like me, um, first of all, were getting pushed out of school. And, and I was one of these kids as well that would be, you know, called out. Uh, I've believed unfairly um, would be suspended, um, you know, et cetera. You know, really pushed out of school. Um, and so I, so I started to, to fight back, right? I think, you know, early on, I started organizing my friends. This was like sixth grade, um, started organizing my friends. We started to um, try to get our teacher fired um, for actually, you know, essentially like targeting black and brown students of which there weren't many in my, I was like one of a few black and brown students in elementary school. And we would just get targeted like continuously, um, called out, you know, you're being off task. You know, you're not paying attention, go to the principal's office, you're getting suspended now, you're not in dress code, you're, you have unnatural hair, so you're going to go to the principal's office, all kinds of stuff like that. So, um, so long story short, you know, we organized our first direct action, we had signs, we had chants, 
um, we really uh, took it to this teacher. And uh, by the end of the year, she did not come back. Um, so I think that was like very early on, like a lesson that one, like we didn't have to take this. Two, that injustices are real, that these patterns are real and that we can call them out. Um, and three, we have the power you know, to, to actually change our circumstances. Now, I mean, this was like a very micro version of, of what the work that I'm doing now, but I think, um, you know, I've always been driven by, uh, you know, a focus on equity, a focus on justice, a focus on identifying and addressing the injustices that are in my face and that are impacting people who look like me. And so I think that that has sort of been what brings me to this day. I think the the method and the specific area of focus within this broader system, uh, unjust system is something that that is more recent. So that is something that was driven, um, you know, really by, you know, as you said, uh, the murder of Trayvon Martin, the murder of Mike Brown, you know, seeing case after case after case of people getting murdered by the police, murdered by vigilantes, the state not holding the killers accountable. Um, and so, you know, I really went from early on, you know, went, went to school, studied political science. I wanted to be a professor of political science. So, you know, learning, you know, uh, how to do original research, statistical methodologies, uh, really diving into doing like academic, academic research. And this was like 2012 or so before Trayvon Martin, um, before Zimmerman's acquittal. Uh, and so at that point, you know, really wanted to be a professor, wanted to study these issues, but I felt like it was a little bit too ivory tower that like these were issues that I cared about deeply that I wanted to spend, you know, my career really focusing on and addressing, but the strategy of doing it by, you know, being in some ivory tower and publishing an academic paper that only like four people in the world really read, um, let alone are interested in, um, didn't seem like a pathway to really changing those systems. Um, and so, you know, after graduating from Stanford, I quickly started working for advocacy organizations. Um, so I started working at PolicyLink, um, which is a, a national research and advocacy organization focused on um, social and economic equity. And, you know, at that point really was focused on educational inequity. So, you know, going to and literally meeting with the administrators of school systems, like in Orange County, Florida, which is you know, where Orlando is, um, and breaking down the numbers. And this is really, really where I, I got started you know, unpacking some of the data, looking at the disparities, bringing that data to policymakers and saying, like, clearly your system is reproducing unjust outcomes. Clearly black and brown kids are getting pushed out of school and we're having worse outcomes in your system. What are you going to do about it? Um, and I saw the power of data to really move that conversation along because so many people would just deny the issue up front. Like they would just throw up roadblocks saying, oh, this is not really an issue. You know, you might've heard that there are some issues with, you know, racial inequities in schools, but not in our school, not in our district. This doesn't happen here. And until you had the, that data to really show them, yes, this is not only happening here, but like there are huge disparities um, in your school system. That really helped to like get us to a solutions conversation about policy and systemic changes. So that's the work that I was doing in 2012, 2013. Um, then you have, you know, Trayvon Martin, you have Mike Brown, um, and it became very clear that those, the work that I was doing in, in the space of educational equity um, simply couldn't do that work in the space of addressing police violence because the data like didn't exist. And this was wild to me because, you know, for at the time, right, this is like 2012, 2013, um, uh, this was the Obama administration. At that time, under the Department of Education, they published the under the Office of Civil Rights Data Collection, which is in the Department of Education, they would publish data every single year on every school in America. And we're talking about, I don't know how many schools, like tens of thousands of schools all across the country, way more than there are police departments, even though there are 18,000 police departments. Um, and they would publish data on every single school, would have information on how many kids were suspended, how many were expelled, how many were referred to law enforcement or arrested at school, who was placed in gifted and talented programs, who was not who was getting pushed out of school would have that information disaggregated by race, by gender, by disability status. You could see all of that. And, you, and that was the data that I was used to using. Um, and then all of a sudden, when we start talking about people being killed by the police or shot by the police outside of schools, suddenly there was no data. We were getting, you know, the federal government was saying, well, we don't actually have reliable data on this. You had um, 538 at the time, the publication published a set of articles 
uh, examining the data collection from the federal government, it's basically saying they collected data on fewer than half the number of people killed by police. Um, and so at that point, you know, it became clear that um, we needed to have the data and collect that data and use that data as one of many tools that would be needed to push for change uh, on this issue of police violence. Uh, and so that's the work that, that I got started doing was building that database, collecting that data, building a system of Google news alerts that literally would, would find whenever there was an article with keywords like officer involved shooting or police shooting um, or in custody death or killed by police, it would flag those articles. I get an email alert. Um, I would log those in a spreadsheet um, and then fill in the details like what, what, what information was provided, what was the race of the person that was killed by police, do, do they have officer names? Um, you know, what was the information about the officers? Had they shot people before? And just gradually building out a, a database um, that now is mappingpoliceviolence.us and is the most comprehensive database of people killed by police in the United States. Um, now we have data for a decade, um, almost a decade. It'll be a decade at the end of the year. Um, and so that's really how I got started. Um, and, you know, I've been doing this work ever since, just gradually building on the database, adding new columns of information, um, doing analysis of the data to better understand, you know, what are the contributing factors to this police violence year over year? Why is it that we're seeing 1,100 people getting killed by police almost every single year, three people every single day, Black people three times more likely than white people, more likely to be unarmed every single year, you know? And so, you know, we talk about this issue being systemic. The data helps to, to bear out that truth because you see it is not just, you know, one officer or a group of officers um, or any one agency or police department. It is a system of 18,000 law enforcement agencies, a million law enforcement officers that every single year kills about 1,100 people. Every single year reproduces similar racial disparities. Every single year is more likely to kill uh, Black people than white people and more likely to kill Black people who are unarmed. So again, like this is a system and in many ways, uh, my work is just collecting the data to track the behavior of that system and to figure out how to disrupt and dismantle it. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> I thought collecting data was dorky until I met you. I mean, you know, that it's it's remarkable to just think about the amount of work Sam has put into this. It, it, it truly is. And so many other parties have like come and gone um, taking it up for taking up the mantle as you never stopped, um, you know, doing the work for a short while and then giving up. Um, and like, you know, I respect the effort, but there's not much value in incomplete or, um, you know, incomplete data or data that spans a very short period of time or doesn't cover a lot of different variables. And, and like Sam's does all of that and like has expanded over the years and, I've learned so much. I mean, one thing, for instance, is that 98 plus percent of these killings that he mentioned do not result in anyone being charged. So we're not talking about 98 plus percent of cops who kill people not going to prison. We're not talking about them, you know, not being convicted we're, or even tried, they're not even charged in the first place. And this is in a country where, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are in jails and 75 plus percent of them haven't even convict, uh, committed a crime. Meanwhile, you know, these cops we know have done this and we can't even get a case against them. Um, so that was one of the wildest things that, to me, that hit me the most in all of these years of looking at at this data, um, but here's the but to me the really crazy part is and people ask like why do you say three plus people a day? Well, that's because Sam has never shied away from the fact that all data collection is imperfect and there's simply no way to know if there's more. We certainly suspect there are more, and we know there are at least three. So that's where, for anyone wondering, that's where the information, the, the specific numbers come from, and not from thin air either. He's collected this data. But recently, or not that, not even that recently, a, uh, a year and a month or so ago, it came out that more than 50% of killings by police are not even counted. Um, and and uh, more recently, I read that 40% plus of deaths in state prisons, local jails, and police custody overall are not counted. 
Um, there was some work done uh, for the Times, some work done by um, Ethan Corey in the appeal, um, and he cited you in that article. Um, and, you know, of course, as um, has been mentioned previously, um, if you're wondering whether the new studies on cops and cages will skew racial breakdowns, um, the answer is yes, Black people are even more likely to be killed than we thought. Um, and the numbers are no different for indigenous people either. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know, I don't even know where to go from here, Sam, like comments on that, like as it relates to the horror of knowing it's even worse versus kind of always knowing it. And then like, what do you say to people who say like, well, how do I trust your data if it could be twice as many? Yeah, so first of all, that report about the 50% undercount from the federal government, um, the way that they were able to, term, to determine that it was undercounted by 50% is they were able, actually able to reference our database, mapping police violence, compare that to the data from the CDC and determine that the CDC had undercounted by, I think it was like 55%. Um, so, so it's not- All right, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. I have to ask, I fucked up, didn't I? Is the well, three- so it's complicated, right? So um, there are more people killed by police than we're able to track, right? That we know because we are largely dependent on information that the police report and information that is reported by local media. If it's not reported in an article somewhere and it's not published or made public by the police agency, or if they don't comply with our public records requests, which in some states they don't, they're not legally required to, um, then we don't get that information, we don't get that case. Uh, and so now how many cases are we talking about? Now to figure that out, um, we actually need to look at states that have, that do a better job of collecting this information than other states. So the federal government has done a horrible job. They announced a program, the Use Force Data Collection Program that was supposed to be run out of the FBI in 2016. Um, even to date, they still have not collected as many incidents as we have, and they've published none of their, their actual source data. So the data is completely useless. Uh, but there are some states that have stepped up and passed mandated reporting requirements around police shootings. So California is one of those states. Colorado had it up until mid-2020, and then they shut off the program. Um, Texas has a, a police shootings data collection program, but it doesn't include shootings of people that miss the person. So each they have like slight uh, differences. California, it's fatal, non-fatal shootings, including shootings that, that, that miss the person. Texas, fatal, non-fatal, but not shootings that miss the person. New York started their own data collection program, which will be more expansive. Um, so now there are a set of states that have stepped up and created their own programs, some of which are better than others. So by looking at the data produced by those states, comparing it to the data from states where we only have media reports to rely on, we're able to get a better sense of what we're missing. Uh, and overall, you know, looking at those states, looking at the differences between states, looking at the existing research literature, uh, comparing what exists with you know, where some of the gaps are, we believe we have about 95% of the total number of people killed by police in the database, in the Mapping Police Violence database. Um, that extra 5% that we're missing those tend to be people in more rural communities, communities that might be, for example, um, indigenous communities, Native American reservations, um, places where if you are killed and the police choose not to report it, it's less likely for there to be observers or witnesses. It's less likely for it to have sort of population density for it to um, for people to be there already on the scene to observe. It's less likely for it to be reported by local media. There's less media infrastructure investment in local media. Um, so those are places where uh, there are likely to be gaps, which means that the numbers for Native Americans killed by police are probably undercounts. Um, and even with that undercounting, uh, Native Americans are killed by police at almost the rate of Black people, uh, like, all, like about 90 to 95% the rate. Um, and so, so, so that those are some of the gaps. Now, the bigger gaps are having to do with people who die uh, in jails and in prisons, as you mentioned. Um, and there have been efforts to try to track these deaths, but they haven't done a good job or they've been temporary. So the Huffington Post after Sandra Bland um, was killed in, in custody, um, the Huffington Post decided to track deaths in jails across the country through media reports. Um, and they tracked about a thousand in a given year um, before stopping. They tracked it for one year. 
Um, so, uh, and again, that's probably an undercount. So we're talking about at least a thousand people dying in jails every single day, in addition to the thousand or 1100 people killed by police. And that's not counting prisons, right? So you have jail, local jails, state prisons, where you have another you know, group of people who knows how many people who are, who are being killed. So that's and, sort of the, the big picture of right. the system. And that doesn't even count, you know, there are a whole bunch of people who are harmed by police who survive. Yeah. And there are a whole bunch of reasons why people survive police. Some people survive police shootings that have nothing to do with the police. So if you are shot by police and you're closer to a level one trauma center or hospital, you're more likely to survive. If you're shot by police and you're younger and healthier, you're more likely to survive. Um, so there are a whole bunch of factors that can imp impact your, your risk of dying from a police shooting that don't have to do with the police. And that's important to track as well, right? Because if we want to understand how often police are using deadly force, we need more information than the number of people killed. We want to know in total how many people are being shot. Um, and so, how do we do that then? Because it's hard enough when, like, you would imagine that someone dies, there is a death certificate at least. But if we have people going into hospitals, or you know, in many cases, rightfully so, communities don't trust hospitals either. So they, they might be getting help in you know a non-official way. I mean, it's gonna be hard to track, probably even harder to track that, right? Absolutely, and this is actually what I've spent a lot of time working on lately is expanding the Mapping Police Violence Database to include non-fatal police shootings as well. Um, and so it's uh, it's been That's a huge, huge. effort uh, yeah. because one, you know, there are some states that do a good job of this. We're able to leverage that. So, you know, we submitted public records requests um, and obtained statewide police shootings databases from about half the states. Um, so, so that's good. We have that. There are still some states that underreport, right? So you'll find media reports of non-fatal police shootings that don't show up in the state database. So even that is, is incomplete. Um, and then we're relying on media reports for most of the rest of that information. Um, and so according to our preliminary estimates, it's about 80% of the time that somebody is shot and survives, we're able to find a local media report. Um, but there are another 20% that are missing, right? Where we need that state database. And if you're not in one of those 25 or so states that has a state database, you don't show up in the database. So even, even expanding to non-fatal police shootings, which still is the tip of the iceberg, right? So, so just to level set, you know, there are about one or two people who are non-fatally shot by police for every person fatally shot. So let's say about a thousand people are fatally shot by police, another hundred people in addition to that are killed by police through other means. Um, so you have 1,100 people a year killed. Another thousand to 2,000 non-fatally shot. Then we're reliant on um, emergency room hospital admissions data for people who are injured and hospitalized but not shot. That's a huge number of people. Uh, and the existing databases are, are woefully inadequate on this, um, but the best numbers that we have are about 55,000 people who are hospitalized due to injuries, due to police use of force um, a year, 55,000 people. So, you know, you're, you're going from 1,000 to about two or 3,000. Now we're at about 55,000 people harmed, hospitalized, not just harmed, but hospitalized due to police. Um, and even that is, is, you know, tip of the iceberg, about 10 million people, uh, 10 million arrests a year that is harm. Those are people who, who end up with, with records, many people who are incarcerated, which according to, to, to research that has recently come out impacts your, your life chances. If you are incarcerated, particularly as a black person, um, you're about 30%, you have a 30% higher mortality rate. So that kills people too, right? 10 million arrests a year. And that is actually impacting people's life expectancy that is causing death over the long term. So Absolutely. that's what the system is, is doing to people and to communities. And we have the data now to show how that breaks down, where it breaks down by state, by race, by community, et cetera. And that is so key. Um, I talk all the time about the various um, prongs to the approach, right? Like there is absolute need for the people on the streets terrifying the man, um, the corporations, uh, the police. Um, there is just as much need for the people collecting data to support the reason people are protesting. And there's just as much need for the people, the professionals trying to get elected to city councils or bringing to city councils, Sam's data and our proposals at the 10 demands or the proposals created by campaign zero campaign zero 
uh, preceded 10 Demands and offered a lot of great suggestions themselves um, or, you know, through that. And um, I'm definitely curious to hear uh, from Sam, you know, what went into Campaign Zero and why it's important. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to, you know, drop a few pieces of information. Um, one being that, you know, we talked about Sam's kind of entry into this space being through educational inequity. Um, and it's, it's, I live in the state of New York and it's one of the most, um, it's one of the worst states in terms of educational inequity. Um, so I'm certainly very familiar with uh, the polarization that exists and the racial elements to that. Um, Sam also talked about experiencing firsthand he, you know, him and his friends were the ones getting sent to the principal's office, uh, you know, harassed over their their clothes or their hair, which is <laughs> inexplicably racist. Um, and and it and this too is documented. Um, and it's also directly related to the Sam, the work Sam is doing now. And I just wanted to draw that connection. It is called the school to prison pipeline for a reason. Um, and there are studies that show that one interaction with a police officer increases your likelihood of future criminality. So that so what that means is you don't even need to be arrested. But we also have some stats that at least three thousand kids were arrested at school, at school from 2000 to 2019 for crimes including crying. Black students uh, made up 15% of the school populations, close to the 13% that Black people represent in the United States overall. And just like the data we see about incarcerations and killings nationwide, Black students made up 41% of the arrests. A six-year-old was held with zip ties because handcuffs were too big. Um, this is exactly where the kind of criminalization begins and where certain children are faced with, at, at a certain, you know, at a very young age, wondering if it's not true. That, you know, meanwhile, um, their communities have already been ravaged by the same pipeline that began a long time ago, um, because as we know, um, policing stems directly from slavery. Um, and this is why in 2020, we built the largest and longest protest movement in our nation's history. Um, and the government responded, governments responded by increasing police spending. Um, and the cops responded by killing more of us in 2021 than in the previous eight years. So um, it's now 2022. Sam, where do we stand historically? Um, what is it? Uh, what predictions can you make from it? And what can we do to stem it, if not end it? So you know, and you mentioned 2021 and, and the reaction of the police to, to the protests. Um, we're, we're seeing that continue. Uh, so, you know, so far this year, 927 people at least have been killed by the police. That's more than had been killed at this point in 2021. It's more than any year on record over the past decade, which is, you know, as far back as we have data. Um, so uh, certainly police violence hasn't decreased. Um, if anything, it has increased. Um, the disparities are the same. Uh, the inequities that I mentioned earlier are true in 2022, just as they have been in the past decade. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things that that is both sobering and and like just completely maddening is seeing how you can have the largest protest movement in history and if anything, police killings have continued to go up. Um, now, that is like a, a very simplified narrative. I think a lot of things are happening um, in different ways in different places. So, you know, it's 18,000 law enforcement agencies. They each have their own policies and practices and leadership and funding streams and, and all of that. Um, so, you know, there are some places where things are getting better and there's some places where things are getting worse. Uh, and so part of what what I've spent a lot of time focusing on is trying to figure out for the places that are getting better, 
why are they getting better and how do we replicate or scale what works to other places so we can reduce police violence there too. Um, and all right. So w- what have you found? What yeah. Works? So, so, and this, this actually goes back to this conversation um, around policy solutions around, you know, the beginning of the, the, the protest movements from those early days and weeks and months and even years and the genesis of campaign zero and all of that, um, you know, taking, information that 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 you know showed clearly that this was a systemic issue um clearly that that there were deep inequities in police violence um and then unpacking that to figure out you know what are the some of the contributing factors I mean, one of the things that that's been clear um not only in the data from this year but has been clear going all the way back at least back to 2015 um has been first of all that the majority of people who are killed by police um either are police responding to a mental health crisis, um, a issue where somebody was not even alleged to be uh, suspected of any type of crime, um, a low level nonviolent offense, um, or a traffic stop, making up the majority of cases in which people are killed by police. Um, So we've got data going back to 2017 that shows that that's true. I mean, even before that, it was pretty clear um, that the narrative that the police are putting out about why the police are killing so many people is a lie. Um, their narrative is that they're encountering dangerous, violent people who are, you know, endangering police lives or endangering lives of members of the public, and so the police have to intervene to save lives. That's like what the police say. And it turns out when you unpack the data, like that, that couldn't be further from the truth. The majority of these cases started out as routine, nonviolent issues. In some cases, no crime was alleged at all. Um, and these are all situations in which now, you know, fast forward. That we're seeing cities begin to develop alternative responses to that are much more effective than the police response and definitely much safer for community members. Uh, and so you're seeing in Denver with the STAR program responding to mental health crises. I mean, not only Denver, you have now in Portland, you have New York, you have uh, LA, San Francisco, where they're piloting similar programs. Um, and again, about 10% of people killed by police were killed after police responded to a mental health or welfare check call. Um, so again, for that portion of people killed by police, there's an alternative response that's already working in some places that should be scaled and resourced. Yeah. And similarly, traffic stops, right? You have traffic stops count for about 12 to 15% of people killed by police. Um, traffic stops, you have places that are just, that remove the police from traffic enforcement entirely. Um, places where, you know, you look at what they're trying to do in Berkeley, um, where they're trying to create an entirely new department that is a civilian department that is responsible for traffic enforcement and not the police. Um, you have other places like, yeah, like in Virginia, they're banning stops for uh, equipment violations for low level traffic offenses. So there's progress maybe being made in some places to address those types of situations. Um, you know, you look at, there's another huge issue, which is, you know, the war on drugs, right? And the number of people who are First of all, just big picture, like arrested for drug offenses is like larger than total number of people arrested for violent crimes combined. So it's a huge por- portion of the system. Um, and it's responsible for a number of the things that we see when we look at r- police raids on people's houses, no knock raids or knock and announce raids, which really are pretty much the same thing. Um, I mean, they're, they're all coming back to um, a set of common circumstances in which the police are being sent in and they really ought to be completely removed from the, from the situation and create an alternative to deal with that. So I think like that's like the, the big picture is like we see this happening again and again and again. But for each of these types of situations, we're also seeing a different way of approaching them that some places are starting to pilot now, largely in response to the protests. And this is a big, this is one of the, the wins of the protests is that now we're seeing real programs that are being piloted and scaled to create a different model that we can point to, to hopefully do that in more places moving forward. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've done a lot of research on that. It's, it's the most important part of what I believe to be the, the road to abolition. Um, Because obviously, you know, we can talk about all of the reasons why we need to be here and sure that is critical to counteracting the propaganda um, that suggests that being a police officer is not the 22nd most dangerous job, but is actually the most dangerous facing serial killers and, and who knows what. Um, 
you know, but coming up with alternatives is the most important because all we ever hear is what about this? What about that? You just complain. You don't have solutions. Well, there are many. And like my friend Sam has said, many of them are already in place and showing incredible results. Um, just to add to uh, Sam's comment on the war on drugs, just to give you an example, 94% um, of those arrested for marijuana in New York City in 2020 uh, were Black, or people of color, I should say, sorry. Um, and this of course, occurs while white people are equally likely to use drugs and actually more likely to sell them. You certainly have never heard that narrative, but the statistics bear that out. Um, and, you know, meanwhile, the alternatives are showing, um, you know, quite impressive results. Um, you know, you could talk about uh, harm reduction, um, for instance. Um, less than a week after opening, New York City's two supervised injection sites, the first in the country, reversed nine overdoses. There's just an infinite amount of research, much of which you can find on 10forjustice.com um, in our resources section by people, you know, like Sam, um, to demonstrate this reality. Um, and, you know, to that end, Sam, tell me about Campaign Zero. Um, how did it how did it come to be? Because I know people are always curious about that with 10 Demands. Um, and how did you, you know, what what um, in addition to the data, what theoretically informed your choices and what did Campaign Zero or what does Campaign Zero recommend? You know, I was looking at, at this data, um, seeing you know, as I described, that there are these whole categories of incidents we could just have an alternative response. The police didn't need to be there in the first place. The second thing that was happening was um, there was this emerging conversation about like solutions, right? What what do the solutions look like? And there was a lot of debate about, and still a lot of debate about you know, what actually works and, and what is a waste of time, what might actually be making the problem worse. Um, but this was like 2015, right? So this was very initial. Um, and the idea was, okay, let's put on the board all of like the full range of solution ideas that have been proposed so far um, and put the available data or, or research support for each of those and figure out like what are the solutions that, that at that time we thought could make a big difference. Um, at that point, I connected with organizers on the ground in Ferguson, uh, Janetta, LZ, Brittany Packnett, Duray McKesson. Um, and so I was having conversations with them around, you know, this is, what does a solutions platform look like? Um, I was producing the research and data and you know, organizing this information. They were working with local organizers to get that in people's hands so they could use it in the protests. Um, and ultimately it was this set of solutions categories that you know, we thought had some promise to them. Um, but at this time, remember, like there was very little real research or, or, or evidence or data that had been produced. So it was very preliminary, but wanted to make sure that like, whatever existed, we're able to put in one place so that people could use it, um, didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, there are ways to replace these things that we've believed since birth were essential and there were no alternatives to. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna give it back to Sam to you know, continue to tell us um, what his data and experience have told him um, is most likely to work and what isn't. And I'd also love for him to just give us a, his take on making changes from within versus creating things um, on the outside. Yeah. So, um, so I think that there are two big categories of of work that is moving right now. Um, I think that there is the a narrowly tailored approach to specific, um, which is more of like a reactionary approach to specific incidents. Or, um, or cases, right? So George Floyd, uh, we saw that George Floyd video and suddenly we're seeing a lot of bans on chokeholds and strangleholds and putting an officer putting a knee on somebody's neck. Like that made sense as a response, but when we zoom out and look at the data, it's fewer than 1% of people killed by police are killed by any type of chokehold or stranglehold situation. So even if we were to address that issue, the big picture, we wouldn't expect the big picture numbers to change any more than maybe 1%. Similarly, no knock grades, right? We saw what happened with Breonna Taylor. We saw Amir Locke. 
response to, okay, we get rid of no-knock raids. Why are these happening? Why are the police breaking down people's doors in the first place and shooting people? Common sense. But when you look at no-knock raids, right, we, we zoom out, we look at the data, we look at the big picture of policing. Again, we're seeing of about 1,100 people killed a year, about 1% of those cases involve some sort of a raid. And most of those raids are knock and announce, not no-knock raids. So again, like we could fix that issue tomorrow, but we still have the same basic problem. So um, that work is in, that needs to happen and, and every life saved matters, right? But we're not gonna change the system through that approach. Now, the, the bigger approach is, is more challenging, right? It's more work, it's, it's, a, it's a more uphill battle because it has to do with really striking at the heart of the power structure that is the police and the carceral state. And that is to remove power from them, to remove resources from them and reallocate those to communities and to far superior approaches to these issues. Um, and so there is data to support that that approach not only reduces police violence, but also can keep communities in general safe. It can have an impact on reducing crime, can have an impact on actually you know, addressing some of the core things that people think the police are doing that they're not doing. Um, so when we look at the data, for example, on arrests, and this is something that, like, interestingly enough, there's agreement across, like, from the, the police people, from the abolitionist organizers, from pretty much, like, across the spectrum, there's agreement that if you are, if, that for more, if there are people who are more likely to come into contact with the police, you're at a higher risk of being harmed by the police, and police use force against you, police shoot you, et cetera that police contact, right, the differential police contact, this concentration of police officers in Black and Brown communities, the higher arrest rates in Black and Brown communities contribute to higher rates of police violence in those communities. Um, now, the police would say, oh, that's all about crime, blah, 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 we're just responding to crime. But in reality, when you unpack the data, you see that only about 5% of all arrests made nationwide are for violent crime only about 8% or so are for um, property crimes. And the vast majority of arrests are for nonviolent, low-level offenses. Again, more, more arrests for drug offenses than for violent crime combined. Um, and so all of that police contact, all those stops, all those searches, all of those arrests, um, they're overwhelmingly not about violent crime or keeping people safe from violence. They're overwhelmingly stopping, arresting, incarcerating people, disproportionately black and brown people who then are exposed to higher risk of use of force and even being shot over these low level issues that again, there are solutions already being piloted to respond in a different way to those issues. Uh, and so by reducing police contact, reducing arrest, decriminalizing certain things and gradually scaling up what we're decriminalizing so we can phase out that system entirely, we can reduce police violence and that's what the data shows had been happening in cities that were moving in that direction to reduce low-level arrests. Um, so big picture, when you look at 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and even a little bit in 21, you see in big cities, there was a reduction in arrests for low-level offenses. That reduction was concentrated in places where organizers were fighting uh, to stop the policing and, and arrest for sex work, for homelessness, for substance use, for, a whole, for mental health issues, for a whole range of things. New York City has led the pack in that up until Eric Adams came in um, and saw a 76% reduction in low-level arrests since 2013. That's huge, that's three quarters, right? So that is like, when we talk about policing, right, arrests, we're talking about millions of arrests that were prevented because the NYPD had to change its strategy. A lot of that had to do with uh, what happened over stop and frisk and the court decision. A lot of that had to do with de Blasio, however you feel about him. Actually, uh, it seems had some sort of impact on reducing arrests. Um, and that's being reversed now under Eric Adams, right? We're seeing those arrests increase again. Um, and it's not just New York City, you know, in, in many of the large cities across the country, you have started to see progress in reducing arrests, particularly for low level offenses. Um, and some of these are like huge, like we talk about the criminalization of sex work. Um, arrests for prostitution dropped like 80% in the largest cities since 2013. Like that is huge progress. 
um, you know, arrests for drug possession, huge declines, arrests for disorderly conduct, for liquor violations, huge declines. And so in the cities that reduced low-level arrests the most, you also saw significant reductions in police shootings, both fatal and non-fatal. And what also happened was, unlike what the police say happens, which is if we stop arresting so many people, suddenly the crime's going to get out of control. Crime went up more in the places that police continued to double down on making more and more arrests in and actually didn't go up as much in the places that, that didn't have that approach that actually moved in the direction organized were pushing them. So like big picture, the places that are really reducing deadly force in particular and non-fatal force too, although we have more spotty data on that, um, are the places that are moving in the direction that abolitionists have been pushing them, the places that are moving to decriminalize um, and, and stop enforcement of certain low-level issues. Um, now that suggests that that's the direction we ought to continue moving in. Um, and now we're seeing that approach is coming under attack. Like the police are pushing back against it. This whole crime narrative that they are constructing is designed to stop that progress from continuing and to reverse the gains that have been made. Um, and so that's sort of where we're at is like this battle fundamentally about um, do we continue to pour money and resources and authority into law enforcement or do we redistribute that power, redistribute those resources um, to community-based solutions. I think that's the path we have to continue to go down and we have to use the data that's being produced, right, to, to help make the case for that um, because I think that's ultimately the, the path that will save the most lives and keep us the safest. Yeah, I fully agree <clears throat> on, on what's going to work to do that. Um, and, you know, I want to just reiterate again how important the data is, <clears throat> how important the work Sam does is. And, you know, there are a few people, um, Scott Hessinger, um, uh, Alec Karakatsinis, two guys I've interviewed before for this show, who are also key because they use Sam's and others' data to make incredibly um, cogent, persuasive arguments and have a pretty large following and, and their things get amplified because like the thing Sam has said today, um, people can follow along. I wish more people were just empathic. I, were, I wish hearing one story was enough to make people realize, but it's not. And so it is a war of information um, and a war of like narrative control. And and that's pretty unfortunate because we have far fewer resources than the propaganda machines, um, you know. But I I do believe, as as Sam has pointed out, that the the, the data does speak, and um, and progress has been made. So there are there's a lot to be um, thankful and hopeful about, even as we see year after year, the number of killings increase. Um, a lot of positives are happening that are, of course, shrouded by that horrible reality. Um, let's finish, Sam, because I'm, I'm now certain you're an abolitionist. What does abolition mean to me? I, I don't care what you think abolition means. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you. It's, it's super important that I collect as many answers to that question as possible, because it is not one thing. As my great friend and hero, Dylan Rodriguez said, it is not a trademark, it's not an identity, it's a way of being, a way of living, and you know that's one take. I love that take, um, but there's also so much more um, you know, pragmatic things that are aligned with that, actual changes that we've discussed on this call that fall under the abolitionist umbrella, and there's no right or wrong. So um, what I think is probably an amalgamation of all the things you guys have said to me. More importantly, what is your take? Yeah, I mean, for me, abolition means gradually phasing out the institutions of the police and the carceral state, replacing them and gradually scaling up um, alternatives that are data informed, that are accountable, um, that track what they are doing so we can hold them accountable, um, and that ultimately will replace uh, what institutions currently exist and do a way better job of keeping people safe um, and responding to the issues that people call that institution for um, than the police have done. All right, fair enough. Um, and let's um, conclude with 
in this battle of information, what do you recommend for someone who is more than disheartened by what they're seeing and doesn't really know what direction to go to go in? Um, what who do you think they are? What are their best chances to approach a and, and by the way, this is major generalizations happening here, but is it best to approach um, a poor Republican, let's say, um, who, you know, is directly impacted economically um, because all the money is going to the police? Um, or do you or do you approach a rich white person on the left who, you know, or I shouldn't say it on the left, who's a Democrat, perhaps a neoliberal who has great intentions and has no idea how ignorant they might be. Um, let's let, answer that for me. And then I have one final for you. So, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question. I think um, some of the work that needs to be done now, there are two major pieces of work um, that, that I think we're struggling sort of as a movement to, to get done because of the level of resources and focus from and, and level of organization from the police um, and not even just the police. I think like it's the police, it is the entire conservative establishment and it is also you know, elements um, within the democratic party. Um, I think the two things that, the two battles really that we're in the midst of, one, we're back in this fight of even having to demonstrate why we need to address police violence in the first place, right? Like it's it's been almost a decade and we're back in this fight where now that the police have started to push this crime narrative, legislators, people who have a lot of power and privilege to change these systems are now more skeptical about doing anything to, to, to hold the police accountable or to reduce the power of the police. So I think that is just like a big battle that we're just in the midst of again, that we have to continue to make the case for why this is systemic. And not only that, but how these alternative approaches can keep people even, even safer than they are today, um, despite they're not being like, the, we know that crime rates aren't skyrocketing. We know that violent crime isn't skyrocketing. Uh, we know that that is you know, a narrative the police are constructing. But at the same time, like we do need to have answers around safety. We need to be taking the data and studying these alternatives and using that to make the case for why these are more effective approaches than what people are currently getting. And I think now that there are enough of these pilot programs running, there are enough states and cities that are beginning to move in that direction, we can take some of that data, take some of those lessons and do a better job of unpacking them for people so they can understand what an alternative looks like. And I think the second battle is um, helping people understand the difference between solutions that are sort of more reactive and narrowly tailored and like big picture wholesale systemic change. Um, because I think back in 2014 and 15 at the very beginning of this, um, it was like you had people who were for any type of change and people who were not. And like, those were the two groups really. Um, and like, if you're for any type of change, like there were some people who wanted oversight, some people wanted more diverse police departments, some people wanted body cameras, some people wanted to abolish the police. But like, even just saying the police had a problem, like puts you in a different camp at that point. Whereas I think now, like we're deep into this. And if you still honestly believe that like, if we just fix chokeholds and no knock warrants and qualified immunity, that this is gonna change the numbers that get reported on people killed by police every single year, it's just not, right? And like, to understand that you have to take the big picture, unpack it for people, unpack what are the, the main contributing factors, um, and really hit that point home again and again and again, because what the police would also benefit from is if they can take all of this energy and, and the largest protest movement in the nation's history and like whittle it down to let's just do like this minor thing. And we said we've done everything. You, you said that we did everything. Problem solved. Let's go home. And we got to wait another 10, 20, 30 years for another protest movement to realize that, oh, wait, like we actually didn't fundamentally change anything. And the same number of people continue to get killed by the police every single year. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's kind of what I consider my main role is just explaining this over and over again to as many people as I possibly can. And every time I hear I'm an abolitionist or you've converted me or I learn or I think this way because of awkward, that that is that means a lot because I know that it's working. If one person 
at a time. Um, and, you know, it's worth noting that, like, you know, uh, critical resistance formed um, by a bunch of people who had decades of activist organizing, lobbying experience coming together and saying, all of these reforms just strengthen the system. Um, and that's what we're trying to, to avoid, right? Um, right now. And um, honestly, I, I, I think that, like I said, we can, we can feel hopeful because we are seeing some positive change. Um, and it's really about leveraging that and the information we have about it to repeat it. Um, okay, my last question. Um, what do you, um, uh, I mean, what do you think the um, people, what do you think the best advice for someone who um, maybe doesn't feel comfortable approaching a city council, certainly doesn't feel comfortable running for it, um, maybe is disabled, young, old, um, has children, whatever, uh, works at night, whatever it may be, can't go out and protest. What should people do in their communities? What can anyone do in their communities to start to create this positive change um, that is happening as we defund, ideally defund the police? So, I mean, first, organize with the people that, that you know, right? Organize with your family, your friends, um, people who have like-minded interests, who care about this issue, might be impacted by this issue, um, and do so with the help of data. Use data as a tool to make the case for change. Like My work is to collect that data, to, to fight the police to get access to that data, and to, to publish that data in a way that it can be accessible to, to communities, to the public. Um, so, so take advantage of that. You know, Go to mappingpoliceviolence.us. Um, and see the data overall, but also for, for your city and for your state. Um, go to policescorecard.org and see a broader range of information on arrests and uh, racial disparities and accountability and police budgets um, to understand sort of what the landscape looks like in, for policing in, in your city, how it compares to other places, and where you might have the most leverage to, to push for change, right? So if you find out that your city has a much higher rate of you know, low-level arrests arrest for low level offenses than, than other cities. You can use that as a data point to say, you know, to meet with you know, your city council member or your mayor or police chief or sheriff, um, or just a, a local organizing collaborative to, to share the information with them so they can meet with those people if, if you don't feel comfortable meeting with them directly. Um, to take that data and say, look, like we have, our city is continuing to, to double down on the strategy, arresting all kinds of people. You see the disparities. Black people are you know, three, four times more likely in my city to get arrested for low-level offenses. We know this doesn't keep us safe. And we know the data shows that you know, arrests for low-level offenses um, don't, are, are not associated with you know, reducing violent crime or, or keeping people safe from actual violence. Um, so how do we address that as, as a strategy? Can we decriminalize some of these issues? Can we make them non-enforceable if the state you know, the state law still keeps them as a crime. Can we make them non-enforceable locally? Um, in many cities, they've already tried this with marijuana possession, and there's already a, a template that you can build on for, for other types of issues as well. Um, is there an alternative approach to those issues that some other city might be using? Can we cite that as an example of what we want in our city? Um, and so, you know, look at Denver Star Program. Um, you know, look at what Virginia is doing to, to ban uh, uh, stops for traffic stops for low level issues and equipment violations. Um, you know, look at, at what is already happening, look at the data that is available um, and, and you know, come to your own conclusion around what are some of the, the biggest issues that need to be addressed um, and what cities are doing a much better job than, than your city in doing that that you can cite as an example to follow. Beautifully said and an interesting take. You know, each one of these responses just builds on the tapestry. Um, and I, I absolutely agree with, with everything you said. Um, and there are those resources out there. Um, you know, the Digital Abolitionist website has a map of abolitionist groups. 
Um, there's an organization, who can I call, that has um, a list of police alternatives by location um, so that people don't have to call the police. Um, Tenforjustice.com also has a ton of resources there, different toolkits that interrupting criminalization or insight or critical resistance has created, um, you know, and of course the 10 demands themselves. Um, so yeah, I, I absolutely appreciate um, everything you've said, Sam. And you know, I, I think that um, the 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 more that we get the data out there, um, the the stronger our our initiative is going to be. So um, you know, I I, I just think that um, we need to continue to build, right? Like. I don't know how many people are using your data, but every single organization working in abolitionist, mutual aid, community self-defense um, efforts in their communities should absolutely be armed with this data. So, um, you know, it's my pleasure to have you um, and I'll continue to try to get that information out there as much as I can. No, I appreciate your work. And, you know, it's great that we finally found some time to have this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much, man. And uh, stay in touch. All right. Will do.